Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Kyle Christensen, and we are here to another Vendor Spotlight for MSP GeekCon 2023. What's a Vendor Spotlight, you ask? Well, it's where we shine the light on some of the most badass vendors in MSP Geek community and want to get them to know them just a little bit better. We're going to dig deep into their history, find out how they got involved in our channel, and most importantly, learn from their experiences and how we can level up as a community. And if that's not enough, we're going to have a dope Q&A session to really deep dive deep and figure out how we can all work together to make our MSPs even better. Now, if you're not familiar with MSP GeekCon, where have you been? You've been living under a rock, a pineapple, your uncle's war prep bunker. Come on, guys. You've seen it. You've heard it. You've seen the marketing. We've been posting everywhere. This is the first conference for the community that's by the community. It's for us as MSPs, IT service firms, security firms, and I'm honored to be the one asking the questions today. If you don't know me, my name is Kyle Christensen. I've been a proud MSP Geek member since the real early days over in LT Geek. I've also founded some pretty sweet vendors in our space. And these days, I'm all about mentoring and training MSP owners and the operators to break down the barriers that hold us back from reaching our full potential. I've been doing this for over 20 years now. So trust me, I know a little thing about how technical professionals can grow in this community. But that's nothing not about me. Let's meet our guests. They're way cooler than I am, I promise. So guys, I gotta say, oh shit, because I wanna tell you about the legend we've got on the house today. Give it up for Samantha Glocker. So Samantha, you're right, I I've seen it, the freaking CEO, the queen of complex systems. This lady's been running an Australian MSP guys for 17 years and building wicked cool cloud software, some, some big name players like the Australian Wine Club, Maggie Beer, Hench Wines and Carmel. I mean, she's been crushing it in the biz for so long. They should just name a freaking street after her or something. And get this, not only is she a badass business builder, but she's also about elevating the role of IT workers across every industry. Right, like this chick sees a world where these tech wizards are the ones leading the charge and she's all about making that happen. So let's give her a warm welcome and get ready for some serious knowledge bombs. Samantha, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. I hope I can live up to that <laughs> intro. <laughs> so, you know, I got to say, like, you, you have a really amazing history. And when I was reading your bio, I was truly inspired on it. And I know for us over here in the U.S., right, you know, we, we, we can have some barriers. And your new operations, Licorice I.O., is kind of really, uh, it's caught my eye a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what you guys got going on. With in terms of of the the software it's built off of really a, a series of events that have led me to this place this wasn't a grand design initially i was really hoping someone else would would build the software i didn't expect us to be the ones building it um but we, yeah we've always talked about uh there being maybe this this other amazing piece of software that would would exist and uh, what it would be like, but uh, it, it's never appeared. So apparently we're building it. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I'm going to play a little dumb here because some of our viewers may not be familiar with Licorice I.O. What, what, exactly, what exactly is the product? Yeah, so I can go into the history of that a little bit um, and and how we arrived at this point, but in the short version is that it's, it's a new front end interface for PSAs. Um, so the idea is you can plug it in under under a minute and you're up and running with a new interface for your service people. So all engineers, all techs, uh, to use a new piece of a new piece of software that's modern, fast, uh, and and really well thought out. Uh, works the way that we think is the way that I like. <laughs> Right. And I know a lot of times, especially with my background, having done the PSA consulting, um, there's always that frustration because sometimes the tool was built almost like in a sandbox, right, where it was really built from this DevOps mind or this financial mind. And the day to day yeah. operations has to almost meet the tool where it's at. Yeah. Did, we did you guys experience the same problem in kind box. of developing this? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's... Um, it's not easy to develop because a lot of the ways that we are, a lot of the solutions that we that we have to come up with in the software don't exist yet. 
So that's where a lot of our time is spent um, with our with our founding partners who are using the software and giving feedback. We're very much in a feedback loop of what is what parts are working for you, what's fast, what's saving you time, what things aren't aren't fast, are slow, uh, and and aren't working. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not from a mindset of we need to check this financial accounting box and we need to get this drop down. Um, what, what we're really trying to do is to interface with the human that's using the software and how they're actually going to be thinking, what information they need to put in at any given time, what information they need at any given time. And what I've found over the years is that we tend to have all of this information everywhere. So we've got our dashboards that are showing some bits of the information. We've got our RMM showing other bits. Um, then we've got our emails, which might have some, some parts and teams and Slack and communication. And then we've got our PSA. So really the goal is to collect all of that and stick it into one thing and show the right parts when it makes the most sense to show that that information so we can make better better decisions and that's that's a little difficult to pull off <laughs> yeah especially I, I assume right and i'm sure people uh, in the channel can understand especially in msp geek right where it's a lot of technicians and engineers and operators that are in the psa so intimately there's always while we love best practice there's always a little 20 to 15% tweak in how we actually operate as MSPs. So that had to have yeah. been a challenge trying to figure out, right, how do I build a tool that's very pragmatic for the majority of us out there? Yeah, and and I guess this was something that I've been really excited looking at MSP Geek and your values and understanding uh, the, the degree of I guess, scientific nature be behind it. One of our core values is empirical. And so we're empirical, transparent, and bold. That's, they're actually transferred from my MSP. Um, but that's really important because we're not, we need to actually measure the, the results. And when I implemented this at my MSP, um, and we built pieces of software to test these concepts. Yeah, they worked at my MSP, but what about everyone else? You know, and we all operate different ways and we're all at different levels of business maturity and going through that journey. So it's really um, being able to work at all of those levels and not be prescriptive to how you need to be working, but just to, to be able to jump in and start working. It's a difficult problem to solve. <laughs> Yeah, trust me. Um, with as many implementations as my past company did and PSAs, right? Everyone had their ways, and they some of them had just things that were true to them, right? Some of us want to be different, and it's not just sake for the different, but you may have a target market, you may have a level of expertise, especially for the MSPs that are very niched, right? Where you might have to yeah. do something different. You might be more field based, or you might be more line of business faced. You might operate with a vendor that's on the back end rather than being front end with the client. Um, yeah. So you mentioned you did work with this and develop this with your MSP. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah. And Carl, to that point, uh, you know, how do we differentiate our own company in the world of, of MSPs? How do we keep that secret source even though we're using a different piece of software? And I find that quite often what we're doing with the current PSAs out there, not to point the finger at anyone because it's been this way for forever, um, but you kind of build your secret source and wrap it around the software. It's not actually something in the software. So um, we're, we're tending to, to not actually benefit in that sense from the software and that we can, we can have that that whatever makes us, whatever differentiates us right in front of us so that we're using it all the time. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, my MSP, one of the, one of our differentiators was we had a client dashboard that we built ourselves. It wasn't a portal. It was, um, I know there are many portals out there and there's the, there's PSAs have their portal. It was, it's, 
its own portal that linked directly into our ticketing system so that we had our clients actually in the ticketing system with our, uh, with us, with our techs. And um, so what that actually, the way that we created it, it, it created this feedback loop where the techs could actually feel and work with the, the with our clients and end users directly. And this was all of the end users logging into the system, not just the, the um, key contacts at the, at the clients. And that actually enabled everyone to really understand what what was really going on in the depth of the problem, the human side of the issue, so that uh, our the 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 results of the team just lifted off. Those were some of the bits of software that we built, and really everyone who worked at my MSP uh, knows that we we did the whole thing as an experiment. We ran dozens and dozens of experiments on, you know, why is this so hard and why is why is invoicing so hard and why is reconciling billing so hard and all of these these questions. And we would replace that part of the company with a new module, so to speak, or a new piece of software or a new process. Um, and we just kept doing that until it started working properly. So I was fortunate enough to have a team who I found who were really interested in doing that. And um, a lot of these ideas aren't, aren't my own. They're, they're ideas of, of engineers and techs and, and teams from years and years of, of time. I really love that because, so my old man, my dad, he used to tell me, you got to be smarter than the tool you're using. And he was, he was a, a machinist, a welder by trade. Right. So yep. he was talking about hammers and chisels and welders and right, blow torches. And right, he was always thinking physical safety and he was always thinking, right, like, hey, if you break the hammer, it's because you don't know how to use it. But yep. for us as technical professionals, it's not far removed. A lot of times, especially with the clients that I even take in my coaching business, right? We we a lot of times like to blame the tool, but we're either trying to fight the tool and not work with it. Or we're right. The lack of process, you know, sometimes makes like it makes it feel like the tool is getting in the way, especially for more operational stuff. And the one thing I love while you were talking that I kept thinking about was that you were working in tandem with the tool you had, with your team that was using it to say, "Hey, how can we better leverage this tool to service our clients and make your lives easier as the technical professionals?" rather than having to beat your head against a wall, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and exactly. those, those compound, right? I mean, you know, you have a growing large MSP. Economy of scale is a real thing. And yeah. those minutes count. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you can't scale everyone doing what they, what they think is best. You can really only scale a process where everyone is consistent. I mean that at the end of the day, that is that is your service and what you present to the client. And part of that can be great people, definitely. But if they all behave completely differently, uh, then that sends a very mixed message to client. And what you're discussing with, I guess, being better than the tool. And this is where I think that we're at. We have. A lot of tools these days who help with a specific task going back to the concept of you know i've got my email over here in my chat and my psa and all the different pieces the thing that i find is probably the biggest opportunity that we have now that i think people are missing is that what is required to bring all of those tools together my dashboard my rmm and all of that information we still rely on our brain we still rely on the person sitting there to actually collect all of that information, know to go and find it, um, know to go and look and be able to look and then bring all that information, make sense of it and then make decisions based on that, hopefully. That's our mind. You know, we've got all this great software, but there's nothing that actually connects the all of the software together in a way that, that makes sense. I guess. Yeah, I know so much what you mean because we're almost, 
right? There's that old saying, paralysis through analysis. But we almost have this this thing now, whereas MSPs, we have so many tools and so many options on how to take care of our customers that the actual ingenuity of being an engineer or a technician now has become reliant on the tool. And I remember I used to tell all of my engineers and my MSP that, hey, guys, don't let the tool replace you, right? The tool needs to be an extension of who you are as a service provider. And at the end of the day, we are service providers, right? We are customer facing. We are customer service facing, which means we need two things. We need customers and we need technicians, right? And it's, it's so great to see a way to make a tool a better resource for an, an any employee in your company, because even finance, right? They get the dump truck unloaded on them because it goes from sales, you know, lack of maturity or just getting the deal closed to service, just finding a way to make it work. And then we always forget about those poor guys in our finance team that have to go reconcile and find a way to get the client to actually pay us. Yeah. And I guess that's all fairly conceptual stuff as well, but to tie it down, you're talking about the team and being able to uh, present your best self. I guess one of where we got to with, we were were building different pieces of software, we're experimenting. We'd gotten to that point as an MSP where we said, right, we actually need to double down. Uh, And in our case, we were using ConnectWise. We actually need to double down and use every corner of the software to be able to grow and to grow consistently. Um, So we'd been through that kind of business stage and um, we were at the point where everyone knew how to use the software. And then um, as we got to 25 engineers and our customers started hating us. And I remember we had this conversation. We were like, why, you know, we're, we're the same people. We're still awesome people. We're still doing the same great technical work. What, what has changed? And what had actually changed for us this didn't come overnight. This was a series of conversations. Um, was that we'd lost the close relationship that we had our with our customers. We'd lost the the secret source, and so what we actually did. This was in two thousand ten. We broke down into three independent teams, completely autonomous, and uh, we had direct phone numbers to each of those those teams. I think they're called pods now, and. Um, then we, we assigned our customers to each each team. And what that did was bring back the relationship. And then there was a bunch of other changes that we that we made. And what ended up happening was we were now using 100% of this, this PSA, of this tool. Um, but the way that we were actually driving it didn't quite fit with the tool. We then, I found we had all of these rules and policies and procedures around how to use the tool. You've got to fill out these these fields. You've got to use these fields. And we would be training engineers on here's how to use the tool. What actually became the sticking point for our growth was the speed at which we could hire and train engineers to use the tool and then be able to keep them using it consistently the way that it, that it needed to be used. And... So this became one of the biggest driving forces to building Licorice was to be able to essentially immediately hire someone without having to train them and have them use the tool the the way that it needs to be used without having to retrain them because that became one of our biggest, most complex issues, the human issue, I guess. (laughs) And that's the one thing, right, is as service providers, right, we're selling people's time for the most part, right? We're selling professional time, professional services. Yeah. And it is a race to the bottom if you're not careful, right? A lot of my clients figuring out the, and even in my MSP, right, we did a similar pod structure when we hit a certain size. It just had to happen. We, we had that same lesson. Um, but what we found with that even is increased cost to do pods, right? Because now, right, there, there's added complexity. So, right, that economy of scale thing starts over again. It's like each ceiling, you have to remature into that next stage. Yeah, you don't grow like this. You grow like, it's like yeah, a stair. Exactly. And then sometimes yeah. it goes down a little bit. It goes down and then it goes back up, right? Yep. And it's that one step back, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward. So, I'm assuming at some point, right, you guys had to have done some serious research or case studies to kind of uh, – and to really figure this out, but before you answer that, I got to ask, 
Why is it called Licorice? <laughs> uh, so my previous company, the, the MSP that we all worked at was called Caramel. And um, because I guess, because it was food related, uh, all of the products, the software that we built uh, was also food related. So we had nutmeg, saffron, um, cinnamon, and one of them was called Licorice. And Licorice was our service tool that we built initially before we started using a PSA. And that was back in 2007. I've got screenshots from the 2007 cloud-based version of, of Licorice that we could use out on site. And uh, it's it's just stuck. There's been, this is probably the third or fourth, fourth let's say, version of, of the software you know, it's come a long, a long way conceptually, but that's, I didn't name it. I can't take any credit. <laughs> at all. I, I got to say though, I was, when I was, while you were talking, I was scrolling through the, your website and I, I do love the branding, the colors, right? I think sometimes we forget to have fun with product names and imagery. I mean, like mine, right? K7, it's, it's Icarus, right? At the end of the day, people go, well, why is it Icarus? I'm like, I don't know. It'd be fun to have a, um, and like an anti-hero as a mascot, right? Just pick something. Perfection's the enemy of progress. Yeah. Don't think about it too much. Ask the tough questions. <laughs> exactly, right? It makes you lean in. If it leans in as a marketing lesson for everybody, then you win, right? If they leaned in and ask, and then you have, you know, they become a prospect. Um, yeah. So uh, going back to the case study, though, like what type of research have you guys been doing? Because I'm assuming like you guys must be, what, only a few months into launch, right? Yeah, we are. We're very... So we're actually pre-launch at the moment. Um, the stage that we're at is uh, we're bringing on, we're calling people founding partners to use the, I mean, the software's probably got 80, 90% coverage of, of what you would normally use in your PSA. So the goal is that an engineer can just use Licorice uh, to deliver service and and not use, put the PSA down. And then the PSA is still there doing the main database work and the accounts receivable and the project management and all of that. But um, it's to get the text out of the tool and onto the work. And um, yeah, so really before we launch the product, we're making really sure that uh, it works really well, that we're not having to train people to use it, that, um, that it's actually returning a whole chunk of time. Um, so one thing that we've we've found going through this process is that it it takes while throughout the day while you're doing things, it takes about an hour and a half a day of just working the tool, the the PSA, and we think we can get that down to about one quarter. That's what we're finding in our initial tests. So I mean the, the yeah well I mean the thing is. You don't become an engineer so that you can use a PSA. No one does. We need them, but really you need to be able to grab what you need, dump the information in your head and get out of there. That's that's the goal. So we're taking, I guess, a pretty different approach. And then if you need it on the go, you need to be able to, to, to use it on the go. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we won't be ready to launch until we're confident that all systems are ready to scale. We've already got infrastructure in Australia and the US where we're ready to scale it out into Europe and Canada um, and other countries that I've forgotten. Geography is my worst, <laughs> my worst quality. But uh, yeah, we've probably got a few months to go and, and a few more. As I say, we're in a cycle, a feedback cycle. So we've got a few more of those feedback cycles with our partners before we're we're ready to launch. So we'll be we're not selling anything at MSP GeekCon, you know. Uh, we're we're interested in people's feedback, and in terms of your first question, the the market research and the 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 uh, the input, there were some decisions that we made, um, like for example, going splitting out into teams, where we looked and looked for research on the issue and what would happen if we split out into teams because we, while we were a series of experiments, we we're also a going concern, right? And we had people that we were employing 
who needed to have stable lives and had families to support. So we didn't want to mess this whole stable business up. Uh, so we spent about six months trying to answer this question, you know, what's going to break? And no one else had done it yet. What's going to break if we split off into teams? The closest thing that we could find was that our accountant firm that we were using seemed to be working in pods. They had one or two senior uh, accountants that had, you know, 20 years in the, in the industry or a long tenured experienced people in the industry. And then they had kind of a few mid-level and a few low, lower level or entry level people. And so we, we actually talked to them about it. And what we found was that people could actually train up and they would work together with the more experienced people and they would get access to that experience. Um, so as an industry, one of the ways that we, that we really historically have worked is to split off into segments of skill. So you've got your level one team, your level two team, your level three team. And one of the issues that we found with that is that you end up with, it's very difficult. If you escalate a job to a higher level team, it's very difficult to see what was actually, what the solution was and learn. So what we saw was um, our accountancy firm was actually, they'd solved that issue. So after six months of searching, you know, that, that's one example. Most of the time we found our answers in um, what I would call aligned or joined industries like the medical industry or military, where they have a series of highly complex problems coming at you that you have to solve and are highly unpredictable. You know, we try and make them as predictable as possible. But so, for example, ER, we would take a lot of lessons from, or I think it's called emergency department here, ED. Yeah. Okay. Emergency rooms, it's hospitals. Yeah. And they're all kind of one in the same. Yeah. So for example, um, you know, what, what would they do to triage? And then looking at that industry, we started to realize, well, they have ER for, um, I guess, emergency type issues, urgent issues, but they also have uh, doctor's clinics for the planned issues and regular checkups and the maintenance and that sort of thing. And so we're looking at our PSA. This was before it had any sort of calendar. And we're like, okay, we can triage in here, but where's all of the where's all of the doctor's clinic stuff for, you know, we need to go and install some things. And that led us down a whole different uh, rabbit hole. But <laughs> I, I, yeah. I know what you mean and I know where you're going with it all because I went through that same exact journey where finding a way, and this is kind of what MSP Geek's all about, right? Finding a way to have the tier threes collaborate with the tier ones and the tier twos and allow them, regardless of nomenclatures, I'm not a huge fan of the tier system. It's a little esoteric for me, but right, the whole thing was mentorship and training and, and doing it on the job, right? Because for a lot of us, we don't have a traditional educational background. And yeah. we, you know, we kind of have to be in that community and as I started to do it more and more, and I don't know if you share this, I started to realize that it was no different than the early days of the MSP or of my MSP, where it was in a garage with just like the three or four of us, because that's that's a pod for it, right? Like that's that pod, real small yeah. business feel, because it was me, one sales guy, one tier three, and one tier one, right? Of course, we're talking about all the little issues that are happening. Yep. It, yeah, exactly. It's just what it is. And in fact, there was a conversation between Isaac, uh, if you watch this, Isaac and I were standing there. He was there from the beginning and we said, why don't we just go back to, you know, we had this issue where our clients were like, who are these people that are coming out? Why don't we just go back to the original company, but we'll have three of them or four of them instead of uh, trying to do one giant giant company and that's what worked going back to a small team that could communicate at high speed because again you've got this highly detailed complex work and it's it's not work that you can miss any single detail on you have to tick every box and that's that's what solved the the problem for us so a lot of those efficiencies scaling msps i know Right, you're, you're really making it to where the tool now is just a tool and I can get in there, work with the client, get my time in and get out. 
Um, you know, I know it's a hot topic right now. We're kind of running out of time, but I just want to touch on it real quick. Is there anything with AI? Yeah, there's a little bit. So the plan for Licorice really is to, first of all, build this tool that you can use flexibly and get get people in, don't have to train them and know how they're using it. Using it. The second stage really is to start to bring end users into there and to add the artificial intelligence. So in the background, what we're what we're doing is is using the ticket history to train the AI data. Um, but our our approach to AI is a little bit different in that it's very user interface focused. So rather than, for example, having an AI tell you here's what to write or here's what to do next or um, you know I guess I guess what I call a black box problem that you don't know how it's arrived at those those results. What we're doing is to have the AI work alongside of you. And so for example, well, yeah, this is this is an issue that's arising right now. What are the other issues around me? What other issues are going on for this client right now? And what are going on for other clients, for example, so that you can actually get spatial awareness while you're sitting in front of your computer. So really, I guess to summarize, you know, the first step from our point of view is get the interface right and working and then start to add AI on top. We actually think the AI is the easy bit, famous last words, <laughs> but a lot of the systems are off the shelf. The difference is how it's actually, I see the AI as like an Iron Man suit. It should actually be augmenting our abilities as engineers rather than just saying, here's what to do next or, you know. Um, Again, don't let the tool replace you, right? Yeah. I don't think that's the game that we're that we're playing here. Yeah. No, as much as I love ChatGPT, I've had it try to write some stuff for me and I'm just like, eh, I need to still edit it, right? Just like a junior copywriter, right? You still need the editor. Yeah, and this is the issue. AI has an error rate. At the moment, it's 1% to 2%. And uh, we, we have Lower no than error mine. <laughs> Pardon? Lower than my error rate. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, when when I was doing engineering work for you know fifteen years and directly on the tools, I didn't make many errors. It was you know a significant undertaking. <laughs> well, I think that's a lot of us. We don't you know sure in the beginning, but you don't have a big opportunity to make a lot of a lot of errors. That's mm. just the industry that we're in. It's like you know if you're if we're doctors, patients die. In our in our industry. Um, you have this a security issue or, you know, a, a data issue. And anyway, I don't want to go down that. <laughs> yeah, and we are running out of time. And I did want to thank you for hopping on. And I think we could keep going on and on about this. And, I, and I'm really excited to see you guys at MSP GeekCon because from what I'm hearing from you is you need feedback, right? You need the community to help you guys make the tool better for engineers and technicians. So I urge everybody to kind of stop by and say hi to you guys. Yeah, we really want uh, to show you the product and get your feedback and, and see what you think. We'd love to see you there. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you hopping on, Samantha. Thanks for having me, Kyle. No problem. And that's a wrap, guys, for today's Vendor Spotlight with none other than Samantha from Licorice.io. I hope you all enjoyed learning more about their journey and the amazing solution from her MSP and everything it has to offer. As always, guys, we want to thank you for being a part of the MSP Geek community, for joining us and being a part of this conversation. Your input and feedback are invaluable to the growth and success of our industry and our community going forward. If you have any additional questions or you want to go check out the cool automation that they've built to help you better engineers, go check out their booth while you're at the conference. And finally, a big shout out to MSP Geek for creating this amazing platform for us to come together and share our experiences and knowledge. I can't wait to see you guys all there. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, guys, keep geeking out. This has been a broadcast of the MSP Media Network.